Hi, and welcome to Story Hour. I'm Katherine Brown Ramsberger. You can call me Kathy. I'm an author, coach, and teacher. You can find me on choresofoursouls.com and groundoneocoaching.com. Kaylee Mullis is also here to take your comments and questions. And uh, I created Story Hour to chat about books. It's my great pleasure to connect writers and readers. And that's why we're here today to connect you with um, Shanessa Gloom's debut novel and Shanessa herself. Welcome, Shanessa. Hi, Kathy. Thank you for having me. It's a, it's a great pleasure to have you. I loved your book. So Shanessa works as a librarian at an elementary school in New Mexico where she lives with her husband and children. It was during her own elementary school days um, when a teacher encouraged her to write a story. Um, the class asked for a sequel and she hasn't stopped writing since. Enemies of Doves is her first published debut novel and the year she spent writing and the year she spent as a librarian definitely show. It's a really great read. Um, when Shanessa isn't writing, she enjoys reading, watching crime documentaries. That's really good research, probably. And spending time with her friends and family. So Enemies of Doves, uh, here are a few reviews of it. Um, Scott says Enemies of Doves deals with heavy topics ranging from PTSD to addiction to child abuse without flinching, but manages to do it while being thoroughly entertaining. Agree with that. Felicia says stellar writing and well-developed characters make this read one not to be missed because that plot twist, there is a plot twist. And Amy says, I doubt you'll guess the ending. I doubt you'll put it down after you read the first chapter. It is a really uh, fun, well-paced read. So again, welcome Shanessa. If you'll show us your cover and maybe you can tell a little bit about how you came up with it. With the cover? Uh -huh. Okay, the cover I actually used a company or a contest on a site called 99 Designs. And it's where um, you'll have different designers. You can kind of give them an idea of what you'd like for your book and they submit designs and then you choose from there. So um, I, I gave the idea of falling feathers. I, I gave a few ideas and what this designer did where he um, cut the feather in half it had that jagged edge that kind of looked like a scar which is also important to my story yeah. so this one just kept drawing me back so that's why I had some great ones but ultimately ended up choosing this design I'm real proud of it it's a really nice cover thank um, you so um to me your novel was a keen and able saga with a few major plot twists. I don't think Keen and Abel, but it definitely, when I first started reading it, I thought this is definitely going to have a lot of sibling rivalry and there's a father. And here's the full description. After losing his parents to tragedy in 1991, Garrison Stark finds himself on the journey of a lifetime. After trying to piece together the ramblings of his grandmother who has dementia and so he has to find the answers on his own. Tom Fitchett, and this is another timeline, um, there, there are dual timelines here. Tom Fitchett may be a prominent dentist in his small Texas town in 1941, but to his sons, Joel and Clancy, he's, he's an overbearing tyrant who never, who's never satisfied with anything they do. Older by almost two years, Joel is re the responsible one charged with looking out for his younger brother. Being the responsible one will lead to life-changing trauma for Joel, just as serving in World War II will change the carefree, self-serving Clancy. They'll come back together as different men, but only one will claim the female protagonist, Lorraine Applewhite, who some people think is a little self-absorbed, I just thought she was young, um, caught between the two brothers. What happens next is caught in the in the winds of time and Garrison shows up in 1991, which is 50 years later, 
to uncover all the family's secrets. We'll see if he does. Garrison's search will cause time to collide, unlocking a lifetime of secrets and the plot twist of 2020. Um, so here are a couple of ex excerpts. My God, you're beautiful, Clancy said. And when he leaned forward, she did the same. Clancy took a firm hold of her neck and pressed his lips against hers. All her senses heightened, yet she couldn't see, smell, touch, taste, or feel anything she had only moments ago. A world beyond Clancy Fitchett didn't exist. It was Clancy who pulled away, spooked by something she hadn't noticed. She turned to see what had stolen him from their private world. She giggled. Silly bird, you star startled us. Clancy didn't laugh. His face turned chalky and sweat dripped from his brow. He kept his eyes glued to the bird as he yanked at the blanket, but it only let out a shrill cry that made Clancy jump again. How odd for him to be afraid of a harmless bird. It's a morning dove, Lorraine explained. You can tell them apart from other doves by their brown color and the sad cries they make. So this little fellow was just earning his name. What's that? Oh yeah, morning dove. What's, what's that? Oh yeah, morning dove. His voice sounded relaxed, but his whole body was tense. He ruined our kiss. He didn't ruin it. You'll have to give it me another try at it later. Clancy stood and extended his hand. Despite all the movement, the dove sat still, nestled into the blanket. How odd. She knelt to examine the bird. You don't think he's hurt. Clancy jerked the quilt harder and the dove fluttered away. Seems okay, he said. Now let's go see about that movie. So it's an interesting twist just having the dove be the omen. <laughs> I, I loved that. I love that you did that. And here's a second one and I'll try to get there quickly. And that was in Lorraine's point of view. This will be in Joel's point of view. Joel overslept, a fact he blamed on last night's celebratory bottle of wine, but his spirits were high. Yes, today was Christmas, the day Clancy would propose, but Joel would arrive with a new face, probably not scar free, but well on its way. He avoided his reflection as much as possible since he started the treatment. The doctor said the silver would take the full two weeks and Joel didn't want to get discouraged, but he had stolen a few glances and it was sure it was and was sure it was fading. Sorry about that. Joel ripped off the bandage like wrapping paper, like it was his first gift of Christmas. He leaned closer to the bathroom mirror and screamed. The scar was not only there, but it didn't look any different, no matter how many ways he turned his head. Joel took the empty silver bottle and threw it against the mirror. The tiny container smashed, but it wasn't enough. The towel rack left a hole in the wall as he yanked it free. He brought it over his shoulder like a ball player at bat. He thought about Daddy, Clancy, and Lorraine, imagining all their faces in the mirror circling around his own. His back connected with all of them, but he saved the hardest hit for his own reflection. Wow. <laughs> uh, that's pretty intense, but so well written. Thank you. Um, so uh, let's, let's go right into the question. I'm not usually a fan of mysteries and there are two reasons. Partly it's because I can always tell the ending. I couldn't in yours. Uh, and the second is that the tropes, and for those of you listening that don't know what a trope is, I think it's really only been around for about 20 years, the term. It's when Cinderella gets her prince, that's a trope. It's happily ever after, or, um, and there are different beats for mysteries. And those that don't deviate at all, I find really predictable and can tell the ending. Not the case with Shanessa's. Um, you 
Shanessa, you dig deep into your characters. So you had me hooked. Um, did writing about sibling rivalry help you dig? And how did you find Joel and Clancy and Lorraine and all the rest of them, the secondary characters too, if you wanna add that. Yeah, I think that um, the sibling rivalry aspect definitely gave me something to work with. I've always been fascinated with the relationship between siblings and maybe that's because I'm an only child. And so all I know of it is what I've observed from my own children. So that definitely helped. And when I'm creating characters, I always try to start out with knowing their backstory. You know, I think we all have some emotional wound that's harmed us along the way, whether it was in childhood or later in life. And um, those wounds kind of make our personalities develop from there. So I always start with that, with the characters. And some, some of them don't even make the book because it's not important. Of course, Joel's and Clancy's was, so it did. But um, there's some great resources that other authors have out there. Um, Angela Ackerman and Becky Puglisi, they have a book called The Emotional Wound Thesaurus. And it's got a list of common emotional wounds and you can look at them and it really digs into if a person had this happen to them, what kind of personality traits naturally develop from there. And then I went in to look into those personality traits to see how people with those traits would act or react. So really I just need, I have to understand the characters even if I don't particularly like them, I have to understand where they're coming from and who they are. Yeah, those books really are a wonderful writer's aid. Mm -hmm. and. I didn't know about them with the first book. I have used them for the second one though. And mm -hmm. it makes it it makes it a richer experience for the writer too, I think. Mm -hmm. For sure. Um so um I'm wondering why you chose it chose the genre you did. Why did you make it into a mystery or even a crime mystery? Right. Well, um, I just was trying to write a good story with good characters, and I didn't think too much about what genre it would be in, but I knew a mystery was at the heart of it. Um, I read every genre, absolutely every one, and like you, I don't necessarily like the cookie cutter formulas either. So um, I just figured because it was had a mystery at the heart of it, I would classify it as a mystery, but that later turned out to be a problem when seeking an agent. <laughs> <laughs> Do you want to go into that a little bit or or not? Because sure, because sure. I had the same problem with with my writing. It crosses genres and mm -hmm. it makes it tough for an agent to find a shelf, a bookshelf for it. Um, so you want to just say a little bit about that? Absolutely. Um, keep, keep writing that way. By the way, I'll buy you. them. <laughs> thank you. Right, and um, when I first started trying to get an agent, I got a lot of feedback. Um, positive and negative and I kept seeing a lot like this is good writing but I can't sell it and I wasn't quite sure what that meant and then um, when I hired an editor she finally told me like look this is not this doesn't fit comfortably into the mystery genre or crime it bleeds into romance it bleeds into historical fiction and so that's not necessarily a bad thing but if you're marketing for it to be crime fiction you have to follow the rules basically and make it a crime fiction and maybe you don't want to market as that and you just want to market it as as general fiction mm -hmm. and so i mean publishers they're trying to make money you know especially when you talk about the big five publishers they want what's going to sell and they know that a, a cozy mystery will sell or or has a better chance of selling and or romance so when you take risk and kind of blend genre it's a risk for them too and sometimes they don't want to necessarily take that on a new author that's why um, there's a, it's a really good thing for small publishers, which is who I'm published with. I read an article recently that said that the small publishers were like the coral reef of the publishing world, that they attract the most colorful fish. And I believe that because they attract different kinds of books than you see from the big five. I love that. I love mm -hmm. that quote. I hope yeah. I can use it because I love it. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I, I find that it's hard to write a book without different elements because then it's not true to life, sort of. Mm -hmm. That's the way I feel. But I agree. Um, so following up on that, I I love your blog. Everybody can can go there. Um, it it really has quite interesting in, uh, posts, and uh, I loved most of what you said, especially this. 
So after hearing many of the same comments, I hired an editor. She had this to say about the genre. Your book doesn't fit comfortably what you just said. Mm -hmm. um, and then uh, and then she said, or you may decide to market this instead as general fiction. And then you say, that was my struggle. And I loved your Kate Morton quote that followed. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm wondering why, if, if, if you had a very, you thought it's going to sell better as mystery as opposed to general fiction, mm -hmm. I would assume that would be why. Right. Yeah. That's a personal question because it's really interesting to me how you decided. Yeah, I, I just kind of, you know, I started marketing it a genre as the genre's mystery because agents want to know. And then when I got the publishing contract, I told them like, I, I think it's a mystery, but you know, you guys are the ones that are going to sell it. I mean, a writer can, can try to, you know, put their book comfortably in a certain category, but I really didn't. So I left it up to them and they did feel mystery was the most appropriate. And then they did put I think um, a little, there was also the secondary category was romance, which I would have never suspected when I was writing it. But, you know, if that appeals to that crowd, that's great. So, yeah, I it think- does, by the way, because mine is more romance than anything, but I would right. call mine women's, uh, market women's fiction. Mm -hmm. And I think that, that our publisher started out with my book as romance. I'm not sure if it's the first category this time. Mm -hmm. It is a love story. It's definitely right. a love story. So we're going to go to uh, questions in just a minute. But one more question for me. Mm -hmm. um, you and I both love to write about secrets, especially mm -hmm. family secrets. And that seems to be a theme on my show for some reason. <laughs> I, I didn't plan it that way. Um, can you speak about the family secrets in your book a little bit more? Not without giving anything away, but. Right. I just think there's something so interesting in fiction about family secrets to think you know your parents so well or you know your grandparents but you don't know what what things haunt them from their past necessarily and mm -hmm. and the idea of stumbling across a letter or or a box and it makes you rethink everything you know is just really interesting to me and so in my story of course Garrison um, he's lost his parents and all he has left is his grandmother and she's got dementia so she says outlandish things all the time but she says that you know the man he thought was his grandfather isn't that it's a man named Clancy Fitchett and that spark for him is enough to set him looking and then of course um, Clancy has his own secrets from his past him and Joel they were involved in a crime when they were boys that left Joel with a disfiguring scar and neither boy would speak of it and you know, they never told anyone about what happened. So there's a lot of secrets. And I think there's just something interesting about that. Um, you know, even when I look at pictures of my grandmother, she's the sweetest person I've ever met. And I look at her and she's got her hand on her hip and it's just a mischievous look in her eye. And I'm like, who were you? You know, I don't really know. Who, you know, I know who you are now, but who were you then? So I like to explore that in fiction. I do too. I, I wrote a poem when I was really young to my grandmother who had just passed, she passed while I was in college, um, about who her wedding, because I was like, I never thought of her even having a wedding. She was just right. always a widow, actually, to me. Mm -hmm. So I, I think that's very true, especially you can see something that the person in them and not the maternal figure yeah. or right. the paternal figure. Exactly. Um, yeah. So, so Kaylee, questions from the audience? comments yes hello everyone i hope you're staying safe and healthy during this time um so we have a few questions here um first uh christy lay is saying congratulations and she's also wondering what first inspired you to write this particular story um great question this particular story um the idea that came first was the twist from it and it actually came from my best friend since eighth grade and she said, you know, it'd be a great twist for a book. And she proceeded to tell me and I thought, well, surely that's been done. And then I just kept thinking about it. And I thought maybe it hasn't been done. And a little bit, just a short background about my best friend. When we were in uh, middle school, she had a dream about everyone carrying around a phone and taking pictures with it. 
and that was before cell phones and so I was like well that would be weird you know and then years later she emailed me and said I had a dream where um we didn't have money and all currency was measured in time and then three years later a movie comes out about that so when she told me hey I have this idea for a twist I thought I'm gonna write it and so it really started with the twist and then I, I developed the rest of the story from there that's wow. interesting. <laughs> so uh, Tatiana Ramzoff says hello, hi, and hi. she's wondering what it was like writing from a male point of view. That's a great question. I get that a lot. Um, I, I wanted to write, I was originally just going to have three point of view characters and they were all male. And then I decided to have a female one as well in the process. But for me, um, the male perspective wasn't any harder. I think I, I write to explore things that I'm not and um, have some distance from that. And just to go and I, I treated it like any other character. Of course, I went and I went through my traits and I, I did that. And probably because I live with, I have a husband and three sons, that probably didn't hurt as far as getting a little bit of male perspective. <laughs> but yeah, I, I enjoyed it. And I've always been fascinated with brothers in particularly. And I'm, I had written a book in middle school and high school, my first actual book that I wrote, it's not published. Um, it was about a brother relationship as well. So I think I kind of wanted to, to keep with that theme in this one. And I just treated it like any other character and um, it was interesting, I enjoyed it. You nailed the, uh, the voice really well. And I agree, I love writing male characters. Mm -hmm. um, and the time period, the 1940s, Mm -hmm. I was amazed at that. Thank Very you. Very welcome. You're welcome. Thank you. So Kaylee, any yes. more? Yes. Okay. So we have three other questions. We could save two for the end. Um, but we have one from Noelle Puglisi. And she's asking, who was your greatest influence with your decision to write this book? Oh, that's a great question. Um, you know, probably, of course, the idea came from my best friend. but. As far as influences, I really drew heavy on my grandparents. My grandfather on my dad's side, he fought in World War II. So that was something I wanted to honor with his story. He, I grew up hearing stories of the war. And then um, my other grandparents, I'm very close to them. And they were, um, my grandma was my first editor and reader of the book. So she was a big inspiration um, for, this, for the story as well. And um, that's who, of course, I dedicated the book to. And when I started the book, my grandparents were healthy and well. And, you know, we were traveling to see them all the time. And by the time the book was published, my grandfather passed away. And like, like Garrison's grandmother, my grandmother is now struggling with dementia. So it really, my, my, you know, everything changed from the start to the finish. So I'm glad that she got to read it and see that when, when she was able to appreciate it. So, so both my grandparents, I spent, you know, I spent my childhood summers in East Texas visiting my grandparents. So that's why I chose to set it there. I wanted to revisit. I was there in the nineties in Carthage and Longview. So that was kind of for them. So I, I would say for both sets of grandparents. What a beautiful legacy for them too. Yes. Beautiful yes. legacy. One more Kaylee, or should we go on? Are there lots more? There are three more questions. So okay. we can do one more now and save two for the yeah, end. Yeah, let's do one more and save two for the end. All right, perfect. So we have another one from Tatiana Ramzoff. She says, Shanessa, what was your favorite book growing up? And that's a great question. I read all the time. Um, my favorite book was probably The Secret Garden. I remember reading it. I remember I just got a bed with little lights on it. I remember staying up late and turning on the light and reading it by that little light. And suddenly I was in that garden. And up until that point, I had read a lot of popular things out, you know, Babysitter's Club and, and Sweet Valley, which I love and always will. But there was just something about that classic. And I just understood what it meant to for a book to take you somewhere else. And I was just, I was in that garden. And so that was definitely my favorite book. It's left a big impression on me. So that's a that's a really interesting answer, and I it's obvious you were such an avid reader because the only an avid reader would become a librarian, I believe, and yeah. especially an elementary school librarian. My friends yeah. who are or were, um, they just found books magical as children. Um, mm -hmm. So I enjoyed that answer a lot. So did. 
Did you know the ending before you began? Yeah, of course. I knew that I knew that the twist would happen. And then I knew that prison scene was going to be my final scene, or I thought it was. And that's what I wrote towards. Um, I knew exactly how it would end and I knew the emotion behind it. And I was so eager to write that scene. I wanted to write it early because I just, but I just knew I had to work toward it and I had to keep it in my mind. And so, yeah, I knew, I knew it was going to end a certain way and it wasn't necessarily a happy ending per se. And so when I had an editor, they told me, look, this ending isn't going to work for most readers. And um, she explained why. And so I went ahead and wrote an epilogue that, that, you know, maybe gave a little more hopeful ending without, you know, letting the reader decide. But yeah, I always knew I, that prison scene was real special to me and it's what I worked toward the whole book. So it was emotional for me to write it. Yeah, well, I can see why. Mm -hmm. um, it's always, I always have an ending because I think, I don't know how people work. It might change the ending, right? As I write, yeah. but not having an ending, I don't know how you work towards something exactly um, although other people say their characters just take over and do whatever they want so mind yeah. you a little bit of that but you not understand enough. yeah not enough <laughs> i have that one yeah. <laughs> um so did you change anything structurally or plot wise um, in the second or third draft you know how many drafts and and did you do had to do a lot of revision or it just flowed because you had that beginning and end and and you you understood your characters right besides adding the epilogue all i really had to do was cut words my first draft was i think 180,000 words which i didn't know but that's like two books so yeah, i was it thing. was way too long and every <laughs> single agent every one of them would have you know not even looked at that so i think i got it down to 145 but by the time i started submitting and even then they were like it needs to be 110 to 120 so that's really the main reason I hired an editor and she helped me. So mainly nothing really changed. There's a lot of things that got cut out. You know, I had some scenes during the war, some scenes with Clancy as a POW, which really maybe felt a little out of place in the story because there was just a few of them. But so things like that got cut, but most, mm. but basically the structure stayed the same. And there was some about Garrison's grandmother. I originally had her and Clancy meeting um, a little side story there and it wasn't in the end it wasn't that important to advance the plot so that got cut too so it was mainly just cutting down my wordiness I'm trying to do better this time with my new novels not not write two just one <laughs> well I think I think we get so excited with that first one yeah <laughs> um this was my first published but I remember my very first first novel which was I wrote in college as my I wrote two theses I was way overachiever but I loved <laughs> I loved books and that was my major right? right so um wow it was really long and <laughs> really not my voice but mm -hmm. um it, it was exciting nonetheless mm -hmm. um we talked about male point of view how mm -hmm. did you decide oh I think you answered that it was in World War II because your grandparents mm -hmm. inspired that part of it yeah mm-hmm mm -hmm. Yeah, my grandma. Um, my Wolverine. parents were that age. Um, they're, mm -hmm. they're past now, but mm -hmm. um, those stories are like none other. And did your Aren't grandparents they? talk a lot about it? No, did my they? grandpa. He didn't talk much about it at all. I mean, he was awarded a, a medal of honor for bravery, and I mean, I didn't. We didn't know much of it till he got older, and we, my mom and aunt, sat down with him and said, "You need to tell us the stories." So we can record it and we actually have it on video thankfully of him telling those That's stories so wonderful. yeah because he I didn't talk about it my much. father to do it i couldn't yeah. he just wouldn't talk about it yeah he said i wasn't anybody special but he he was of course he was I mean, right there, there there's a few stories i have so mm -hmm. it was almost like if they won a badge of honor they they had been through too much and never wanted to talk about it again yeah right it's interesting exactly. isn't it it is. It really was. Mm -hmm. um, so the the dubs, the title with the dubs, mm -hmm. I get it. But did it <laughs> did you know that going in? Yeah, the title actually came first. Um, as a writer, I'm forever like, oh, that would make a good title or that would be a good story. We all do that. You know, that'd be a good name yeah. for a character. And when um. Years before I started the book, we had a nest of doves that were nesting in our carport. 
and our children were very fascinated with watching them, of course, and the, the eggs. And and one day we were leaving, and a hawk swooped down near <laughs> near the carport. Oh and I, yeah, my husband said, "Oh no!" And the kids were like, "What? Why?" And I said, "Well, a hawk is a natural is their natural enemies of doves." And my husband mm. said, "Well, that'd be a good name for a book." And I was like, "It would be." So I went home and wrote it down. So then when I had this idea with the plot twist come up, I thought, "How can I work? How can I work towards this title and make it a?" It does be important to the story. So actually the title came first in this case. Well, it's such an important symbol, the mm -hmm. scar and the doves, which is why I chose the excerpts I did. Yeah. Um, and they go together. I mean, mm -hmm. not just in the book, but yeah. yeah. So, um, right. So I'm wondering in terms of being an elementary school librarian, what that taught you about writing? Did it teach you anything about marketing? Because you have to capture the kids' attention. Yeah, it taught me about writing. I think I, I read stories every day, or of course I did before the pandemic, you know, but I read every day to them and that gives you a ear for stories and, and uh, rhythm of stories and little kids, you got to keep their attention. I mean, you can't be, you know, you can't go on and on you have to get to the point so it really helped me with structure too and as far as marketing um you know i pick out a books for our library and i i always try to research and do all i can but you know we get really busy so when it comes down to it i'm looking at the a little thumbnail of a cover and a paragraph about the book so that mm -hmm. taught me how important cover is and how that blurb because that's what a lot of bookstores libraries look at and that's all that's the all the only chance you get for some people so it taught me that. Yeah, very true. Mm -hmm. um, so what's next in your writing life? What are you working on now? And then we'll go to final questions and, um, and you can tell the viewers where to find you in your books. That's a lot, I'll guide you through it. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm, I'm working on my second novel and right now it's uh, the tentative title is A River of Crows and it's similar to Enemies of Doves and that it's told in two timelines. This time it's gonna be the 1980s and the early 2000s. And it's about a sister who's um, going back to figure out what happened to her brother who um, disappeared when they were children. And of course, when doing that, she's gonna uncover a lot of family secrets. So I'm kind of keeping the bird motif and the family secrets for the second one. That's really cool. That's really cool. Well, good luck on that one. Thank you very um, much. So, um, let, uh, Kaylee, let's go to the audience. All right. So we've had some questions and comments added since I was last on, but uh, we have one from Noelle Piglisi, and she says, unrelated to the book, but in reference to your best friend, does she dream of any lottery numbers? LOL. <laughs> I, if she does, you'll know because you'll hear about me winning the lottery. <laughs> yeah. That's and true. then uh, we have uh, Marilyn Rice. She says, howdy y'all, greetings from across the pond. And she also says that she missed the beginning, but she's wondering why the guest is coming to us from a car and she's intrigued. <laughs> okay, well, I am actually on my way to go camping with my family it's my first ever camping trip so but I'll, you know after how that goes but we're in Cloudcroft New Mexico and I was going to be set up outside in the beautiful trees and there's a storm coming so I didn't want to chance it so I had to move into my vehicle <laughs> so that's why I'm in my car <laughs> I think I'm going to go in my car for the next one because the lighting is so nice oh well, thank you <laughs> it really is and the audio is clear it's amazing. Great. It works. Yeah. yeah. So we have a comment from Tatiana Ramzoff, and she says, Kathy, I love these story hours and getting to know the authors featured. Very interesting and informative. And I have enjoyed all of them and can't wait to read their books. Thank you. Oh, thank you so much. Thank you. And we, and we have one final comment from Claire Fullerton, and she just says, great to see you all here. Hi, Claire. Claire. <laughs> So um, thanks everybody for watching. Uh, Shanessa, please um, let us know where we can find your book and uh, 
where people can read your blog. I, that's especially important because I love your blog. Thank you. Um, yeah, my book is available on Amazon and Barnes and Noble. Um, I'm working on getting it into some bookstores as well, but for now it's for sure on Amazon and Barnes and Noble. Um, you can reach me on any social media. Facebook is where I do most of my work on, and it's um, got a link to my website with my blog on there as well. Um, I'm on Twitter and Instagram and the vaguest of ways because I'm old and I'm trying to learn it, but you can reach <laughs> out to me. I feel old when I'm on Instagram, but you can reach me in any of those ways. I love to connect with readers. So I feel I old to... when I'm on Twitter, um, when I'm on Twitter, because oh, Twitter is hard and it's like, you only get so many characters and that's for writers. That's not easy. You know, like yeah, they write a, lot. It a little bit, but I tell you, I, I can write something and put it up there, but then I'm thinking, well, where does it go? Like, <laughs> right. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know either. <laughs> so uh, here's I, here's my tea bag wisdom for this week, and I'll show it first. So it's very small type, so I'm going to read it. It took me a minute to think how it applied, and I think it applies a lot to the to the brothers. It also applies to the villains, the the antagonists, but. Compassion is a state of constant giving of the self for others. And isn't that all about Clancy and Joel? It is. Yeah, um, that's perfect. And I will um, not give any more away. I invite you all to read this really great mystery that's more than a mystery. If you like character development and sense of place, you're really going to love it. Um, and if you have anyone in your family who's a vet, you'll love that too. It's not a big part of the book, but it's there and it's a crucial, it's a crucial turning point. Um, and any final words, uh, Shanessa? No, thank you so much for having me. I also love your, your story hour and I appreciate getting to be on it. So thank you. Well, thank you so much. I, it's my pleasure doing this. It's so much fun for me. <laughs> All right. Bye for now. See you next Bye. week. Shoresofoursouls.com.